Good evening. Good evening. Welcome back to Edible Education 101. It's been a lively week. I feel like we are in the midst of making history in this class. Um, each week you've had the opportunity to hear from people who are influencing the, not only the future of food, but in some ways the national debate. A uh, quick reminder that this is a technology-free zone, so if you've got your laptop out, we really appreciate that you put it away in time for our speakers. The speakers who are still working on their slides have the permission to use their machines, but the rest of you, please turn it off. You'll recall that one of the themes of this class has been to develop our X-ray vision and to start seeing into the trans seeing transparently into the nature of things in the food system to understand how everything is connected. So last week, remember with Saru, she gave us some insight and some vision into the realm of restaurant labor and workers and the connection between low wages and sexual harassment. Um, the first week, Alice Waters talked to us a lot about the values of the slow food movement, and we got a view into how that manifests in terms of things like t terminology and, and labeling. Um, tonight, we're going to be using our x-ray vision to be looking inside the human body and into the microbiome, this incredible ecology of bacteria that we're learning so much about. And tonight, we actually have three gentlemen who are really defining and leading the scientific research in this field. And if you did your reading for the week, you'll note that they are celebrated in recent articles, books, films. These are the people that are making headlines, and I'm really grateful for their friendship and collegiality driving from places east like UC Davis and places south like Stanford University. So in a minute, I'm going to introduce you to our speakers, Professor Bruce German, Professor Chris Gardner, and Professor Justin Sonnenberg. So we're going to take attendance now, take out your clicker, be ready. There's three quick questions for you. Just to make sure you did the reading. According to Justin, MAC is A, the name of a popular makeup store, B, McDonald's best selling burger, C, microbe accessible carbohydrate. Any guesses? <laughs> Let's see who's here tonight. And if you answered in the first 10 seconds, redo your clicker in case it wasn't on. This is a giveaway, okay? So what do you got? What do you got, Rohini? Let's see who's really paying attention here. Oh, you have to switch between these two things, yeah. All right. Yeah. And then we'll go back and forth. Oh, good. <laughs> All right, for you makeup hounds, here's the next question. Here, let's switch back. Okay, according to Bruce German, HMO means A, health maintenance organization, B, human milk oleosaccharides, or C, hospital medical officer. A, B, or C, just to make sure you're here and paying attention tonight. All right. What do we got? Okay. A few of you didn't do the reading. <laughs> 19 of you to be exact. So congratulations to those that got it right. And the third question tonight, to restore your gut bacteria, this is the bonus question. It's best to A, fast for three days, B, take high fiber probiotic supplements, or C, eat lots of fiber rich foods. A, B, or C, vote only once. <laughs> Okay. 
The right answer is C. Most of you got that right. Thanks for coming tonight. Thanks for playing. OK, let's go back. All right. So you're all excited about this. I know your first assignment has been de defined and designed. I want to go over it with you real quickly. I'm going to do it to avoid you having to ask the readers and graduate student instructor questions during the week, because they're getting a lot of questions. I know some of you, a few of you in this class, care about your grade in this class. So pay close attention now, and I will give you the details. The, the paper is going to be due at 6 PM on March 1st. It's to be three to four pages in length, and we've given you the um, typing specifications in the rubric. The assignment and the rubric are posted on B courses, and this paper counts for 25% of your grade. It's important. So just to remind you, the paper has to be submitted no later than 6 PM on March 1st. Papers will be marked late. If the time stamp on B courses is after 6 PM on the Wednesday, they are due. No exceptions. That's Rohini. No exceptions. Late papers will receive a one-third letter reduction for each day they are late. If you ask the readers or GSI this question, you will also receive a one-third letter reduction to your grade. <laughs> Can I read you the question? I'm, I think you'll like this. This is, a, this is going to be a thinking paper, OK? Here it is. Calculate the benefits and consequences of your choices. That's sort of the theme of this paper. Con calculate the benefits and consequences of your choices. Your Aunt Gloria has just left you $250,000 in her will with instructions to open an innovative restaurant that serves delicious food in a healthy and sustainable manner. Your challenge is to design and describe your new business in vivid, mouth-watering detail. First, identify and define three core values that you, will, that you think will make the restaurant an overwhelming success. Tell us the story of your restaurant. Describe it and what makes it different from other offerings. Define the demographic and cultural details of your target customer. You can also define the name and describe the proposed location, etc. Be sure to explain how the core values you chose will contribute to making the restaurant successful. Identify the benefits, implications, or unintended consequences of the values you choose to live by in your restaurant, i.e. the impact on costs, size of customer base, limitations of supply, labor, or any other individual community societal or planetary impact. That's the first part. Second part. Next, choose one simple item from your new menu and describe it in precise, factual detail. Trace and describe the complete supply chain of the key ingredients that make up this dish, including how and where and by whom the ingredients are produced. Also define and describe any and all implications for personal well-being and planetary sustainability for the dish you selected. So that'll give you something to think about. We want you to have fun with this. You're supposed to use your imagination. We want you to bring some kind of design insight to the type of restaurant, the type of customer that you want to serve. And also, probably most importantly, how you're going to do it and the values you bring to guide those choices. OK? So quick review, we're already in week number five. One, two, three, four, five. We've had five amazing lecturers. We heard from Alice, really the standard bearer of this course and this food movement. Robert Reich, who was here, really you know, complimented Alice as being somebody that really did inspire and catalyze a food movement. The second week, we had Mas Masamoto, a third generation family farmer from the Central Valley. Um, I don't know if you've seen Robert Reich's uh, resistance report, but he is, on, he is live every day at 5 o'clock. It's an amazing way to get the, 
the week's uh, or the day's news. We had Naomi Starkman from Civil Eats join us to talk about the importance of a free and independent press. We're seeing that play out every day. And just last week, had, we had Saru Jayaraman from Berkeley um, talk to us about the importance of um, paying attention to fair wages and restaurant labor. And then just three hours ago, we heard, Sar <laughs> we heard Saru talk a lot about Andrew Pudzer last week, the former chairman of CKE Restaurants. And he has now withdrawn his nomination for labor secretary which has huge impacts. You can applaud, it's okay. It is Berkeley. You don't have to, but. So again, I just, you know, I, I just wanna underscore, I think um, we are living in a historic time. Uh, this class, its content, its questions, the ethics of eating that are coming forth for us all are playing out front and center on both the national and global stage while the class is unfolding. Same thing for tonight. Um, I think we are really on the cusp of a great transformation both in uh, nutrition and in medicine. Uh, we now have the ability to begin to, um, to, to see within ourselves and how our personal relationship to food and the environment comes into being from before birth all the way through our lives. The three gentlemen here, as I mentioned, are really defining this field. It's a great pleasure to have them with us today. I'm gonna to e ask each of them to speak briefly. They could each speak for the entire class, and I think you'll want them to, but um, in an effort to kind of give you a rapid, condensed orientation to this fascinating subject, I'm gonna invite Bruce to come up first and give us a brief history of nutrition science so without further ado, please welcome Bruce German to the stage. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm delighted to be here, actually from Davis. Are you turned on there with your microphone? I think I am. Okay, am good. I? I'm not. Oh. It says I'm... Okay, you are. Okay. Um, and I'll, I'll be talking about Davis as I go through the talk. Hopefully uh, you will appreciate by the time I'm done that we're not just the sports teams that everybody wants to have as their homecoming opponent. <laughs> but I'm gonna take you basically through a little bit of the background how we got where we are, um, and to an extent how, how you all and the, and the food industry got where it is. And, and actually it's a story of spectacular success. Uh, the 20th century was defined scientifically and industrially by basically a single scientific field, chemistry. This was a spectacular success story. Uh, we learned about the world around us in molecular detail, and we brought that knowledge into, uh, in essence, the world around us, and changed the human condition in an unprecedented ways. Um, and, uh, and actually, you're sitting on, wearing, watching chemistry in action. So, so how did that work? At its core, chemistry is a reductionist science. The principle of chemistry, you take things apart in order to understand the individual elements and then put them back together. That's a wonderful model for science, and it turns out it's a wonderful model for industrializing that science. Because when you take things apart, isolate them, purify them, you can predict how they're going to behave. And so you do the same thing industrially, and now I know how material is going to behave. That's the basis of the spectacular success. And, and there are a lot of things that, that had changed, but perhaps one of the great successes was by taking food apart. So taking food apart into its component molecules, nutrition, as its early stages, could, could use what engineers call a fault model. The fault model is you take a complex system apart, you put it back together, you take one thing away. If that component was necessary, then the system basically fails. That principle was used for the molecules of food. And now we know, as mature scientific knowledge, every single molecule we need to grow, reproduce. Every vitamin, every mineral, every amino acid and fatty acid is, uh, is actually known. Of the hundreds of thousands of possible molecules, 
We know every single one that you need. That's a spectacular scientific achievement by any criteria. Scientists are still debating how many planets there are in the solar system. We know everything you need to eat. That is a spectacular achievement. And you don't even appreciate how spectacular. That is to say, um, I would hazard a guess if I asked any of you how often you wake up in the morning and go to the silvered glass and check your neck to see how the goiter's doing. Most of you don't even know what a goiter is. But over 100 years ago, people of your age would genuinely be worried because you'd see them. You'd see people with these horrific, disfiguring swellings due to iodine deficiency. You'd see people with their legs bowed because of rickets. Not only have we understood and eliminated essential nutrient deficiency diseases as a disease, we've eliminated them from our mentality. We don't even think about them. You don't worry about them. That's the great success, a magnificent achievement. They're gone, and you don't worry about them. What a wonderful scientific achievement. But how is it possible to bring that knowledge into practice? So when a society acquires knowledge, there's basically two ways you can deliver that to society. One, you put it into education, K to 12. We know how to do that. You put it into the curriculum, you teach kids, you test them. If they don't know it, they don't pass. We can educate the population well. Or you can industrialize it, put it into the world around them, and they get it even if they don't know it. And the decision for essential nutrients was to put it into the world around you. We don't teach people where they get iodine, we iodize salt. An absolutely brilliant public health strategy. Because in fact, you can get a nutrient deficiency disease at an age before which you can be educated. So the idea of nutrifying the food supply was a wonderful one. But we're not the same. Uh, take Star Wars, I mean, does, does Liam Neeson and Natalie Portman have the same in essence nutrient requirements? Well, of course not. Why don't we personalize? Why don't we have to dose everyone in the exact amount they need? Because of a remarkable biological property. So if you don't get enough of an essential nutrient, you get a deficiency, everybody. But if you get enough, what happens if I take more than I need? Twice as much vitamin C, five times as much, 10 times as much, a hundred times as much vitamin C as I need, what happens? I just pee and poo out the excess. It's a remarkable, in essence, biological process, and what it makes possible is a strategy for public health. How do I make sure everybody gets enough? I overdose everybody. Everybody gets more than they need, Liam gets all he needs, and Natalie Portman just pees out the excess. A wonderful strategy, and what that meant is you didn't need to individualize. We could make public recommendations for diet. We nutrified everything. Nutrition deficiency disease is gone. Magnificent achievement. But there were consequences. Because we, in essence, chose not to educate, diet and health became an elective. And we all know what happens when it's an elective. Students elect not to take it. And the food supply, free from the worry about essential nutrient deficiency diseases, you didn't worry about a, getting a goiter anymore, so the marketplace drove, the, in essence, the evolution of the food supply based on one dominating criterion, delicious. If you're going to compete in the marketplace today in food, you better be delicious. If you're not delicious, you can't compete. So the food supply has been getting more and more and more delicious because that's the key criteria on which we choose. Uh-oh. So we are an uneducated, ignorant population in this huge, hostile environment. What a surprise. We're not making good decisions. So that's in basically the environment that, that, that this great success of chemistry has left us with. We should be the healthiest people in human history. We know more about health than ever. We invest more. Interestingly, in some criteria, we are spectacularly healthy. We will all live, you will all live a long life. The problem is the quality of that life isn't the same. In fact, some people are spectacularly healthy. Jerry and Roger are playing the sports they learned as children. They're both over 100. 
spectacular success. On the other hand, the average person today is uh, overweight, pre-diabetic, hypertensive, and genuinely compromised quality of life because of the diet they're consuming and its effect on them. So in fact, we are now seeing people living longer, but their health quality is deteriorating. And the epidemics of diseases are non-communicative, but they are debilitating. So the health is deteriorating for the population. Agriculture itself, its value proposition, is, uh, is in, in, in a state of chaos. There's no money in it. It's the lowest paid enterprise, even though it's the world's largest. There's enough money in it to even pay the workers a viable wage. And it's not sustainable. Perhaps the best example of this is milk. If I go through the San Francisco airport, go through security, they take away my beverage. Right? So I go through security, what's the first thing I encounter? A kiosk to sell me back single serving beverages. Not surprised. So in, the, in essence, the, the airport, single serving water and single serving milk are side by side. What's cheaper? The milk. What that means is to the consuming public, California dairy farmers are lowering the value of water by putting it through their cows. That's what agriculture has become, this massive cost-driven enterprise. Life sciences are still stuck in this reductionist, pharmaceutical-based, disease-centric model. Wait till you're sick, try and cure you. And science is great embarrassment for 70 years. We have invested not in health, but in the diseases of middle-aged rich men. Full stop. That's the embarrassment. So what we would like is to change that. We would like to be able to, in essence, recommend diets, lifestyles that, that literally prevent disease, improve your health. Great idea. Problem is we don't know how to do it. We have no idea, literally, how to intervene in healthy people to make them healthier. Because if I'm going to prevent disease, I literally have to make healthy people healthier in all aspects. If I get a diet that lowers the risk of one thing, but in so doing increases the risk of anything else, I haven't made you healthier at all. And we don't know what are the processes, the structures, the pathways on which we work so that they get better. We don't know how to do that. And there's three real problems with prevention. One, efficacy. What do I work on? What target do I act upon that makes healthy people healthier? Second, safety. It has to be completely safe. Again, if it makes a subset of the population less safe, it can't succeed. And finally, the value proposition. How much are you going to pay for a disease you're never going to get? How much did you pay for that ion today? Ironically, you pay more for salt that doesn't have iodine. So there are real problems going forward in pre prevention. So, we don't know where we're going, we don't know how to get there, we need a new model. And that's, the, in essence, the framework that we began to research at the University of California, Davis. So, we recognize there are new, food, new tools coming to food. So, in fact, the science of the 21st century is biology. Biology is an integrative science. You look at the complexity of organisms, ecosystems, it recognizes the complexities of individuals, that's the new science. We're already industrializing it. If you ate yogurt today, you paid to consume a living organism. So the science is becoming, in essence, more relevant. Chemistry is changing. Chemistry is now looking at biology in accurate quantitative detail. The math is different. <laughs> or not. It's okay. So the new math is the math of big data. The data of large databases interrogated remotely, that is changing the world. And already bringing to practice. If, uh, if you use Google Maps to get here, then you're using big data. It's also coming into health. This is not an image, this is an NMR spectrum. It's an NMR spectrum acquired in a three-dimensionally oriented magnetic field. It's a data file. What that means is you can send that data file to anyone you want. That's my heart. 
It's a data file. I send it to a friend of mine, Matthias Friedrich. He's a cardiologist. And it turns out I have a small scar in the upper left where Susan Scott broke my heart in the eighth grade. But, but he's able with this data file remotely to tell me how my heart's doing. So math is, 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 is completely changing. Don't quit math. Finally, engineering. Engineering is no longer the engineering of massive installations to crack petroleum, crack soybeans. It's small, personal, fast, furious devices. So those are the tool sets we're bringing to, uh, to diet and health. So biology is all about genomes. The public has invested massively in sequencing organisms. The University of California, Davis, is the largest repository of genomes in the world. Not just humans. We have viruses, bacteria, yeast, mold, algae, insects, plants, animals. We have a remarkable knowledge of the entire phylogenetic tree. And we can interrogate it genetically. And so we can ask a simple question. What evolved under the constant Darwinian selective pressure to be nourishing. Why don't we just ask evolution how to nourish, to be protective, preventative, and use the genomes to intend and to interrogate them to tell us well, how, what should we eat? The problem is when you do that, you realize it's a war out there. If you look, what has been the strongest selective pressure throughout evolution? It's to avoid being eaten. And if you're still in the gene pool, you're good at it. So in fact, most of the organisms that we would want to eat, plants especially, they can't run away. They've developed remarkably clever strategies to avoid being eaten. Toxins, anti-nutritive factors, if you want to get rid of your major professor, plants will tell you. But nourishment, not so much. Turns out there's only one thing. Lactation, this remarkable process that came about very late in evolution and is the basis of spectacular success of mammals. And it's our model. It's the mother-infant pair. Mothers literally dissolve themselves to make milk. Everything costs them. If the component in milk doesn't help the infant, the pressure on the mother, the cost, drives it out of evolution. But if anything in the milk encourages the success of that infant relative to its genetic peers, it's hard to imagine anything under stronger positive selective pressure as a food component. And that Darwinian engine of nourishing healthy infants to be healthier has been going generation after generation for over 200 million years. And that's our model. So we've been taking lactation apart from marsupials to humans to figure out what is it that we should learn from this evolutionary history. So, it's caused us to change our thinking about food in general. And let me give you an example. So remember the model, the mother-infant pair. The cost of the mother is massive. If it's not of value to the infant, it's going to be lost to evolution. Well, imagine our surprise, taking human milk apart, and we find out that the third most abundant component in human milk is completely undigestible by babies. Why would mothers? dissolve themselves to make something the baby can't even digest. So the first question is, what is it? Well, thank goodness we're at University of California Davis. Carlito Labrilla, one of the leading analytical chemists in the world. He literally builds analytical instruments to take biopolymers apart and study them. He applies these methods to, uh, to milk, and it turns out these are oligosaccharides, sugars in polymeric form very stereospecific linkages between the sugars. And those linkages have no enzymes in the baby to break them apart, so the baby can't access the sugars. And it turns out there's not one of them, there's not two, there's dozens of them. Milk is full of this material. It, it's spectacular. So we know what it is. The big question, of course, is why would mothers do it? What does it do? So our thought, my thought, well, if it doesn't feed the baby, it must feed something else. It must feed bacteria. So we recruited to the program David Mills, professor at the University of California, Davis, world famous microbiologist. He studies microbial communities from wine vats to human intestine. He developed a whole new way to, in essence, measure the growth of bacteria so he could test do bacteria grow on human milk oligosaccharides. And he broke my heart. No. 
Bacteria can't break them down any more than a baby can. And he's trying bacteria after bacteria after bacteria, nothing. Oh, and then he finds one. What a surprise from the intestine of breastfed infants. We sequence the entire genome of this bacterium. It's a bifidobacteria. It's a very select strain. In fact, it's quite different than most even bifidobacteria. 700 genes different. But when we mapped all of the oligosaccharide linkages for the sugars, in bifidobacteria longum subspecies infantis, there were genes encoding enzymes to break down every single one of those linkages. This is clearly a bacteria co-evolved with the oligosaccharides in human milk. And that, of course, is the genius of milk. Mothers are recruiting another life form to babysit their baby. And they're making sure that this is the one that grows because this is the one that they feed. What a remarkably ingenious idea. So it's not just mothers and babies that are under this selective pressure. It's these bacteria. So we had an initial customer. Who would need this? Well, of course, breastfeed, breastfeed, breastfeed. But Mark Underwood, head of neonatology at the medical center at, at Davis, imagine his, uh, his world. He takes babies from mothers, premature, typically born by cesarean section. That means they're born sterile. They get no bacteria from the mother. He puts them in an incubator, and those bacteria begin to acquire bacteria that will live with them the rest of their lives. And where are they coming from? The hospital. This is not the way you'd like to start life. So in fact, Mark, he said, could we try the strategy from, uh, that you've discovered? So we combine human milk and the oligosaccharides with bifidobacteria infantis, and lo and behold, these premature babies filled up and just like normal term babies, uh, in essence, were protected by pathogens. So clearly this strategy uh, works, and it needs to be brought to practice. So in fact, we decided that this needed to be, in essence, a product for the NICUs around the country. So we launched a company, the faculty involved, um, to do this. But while we were doing it, uh, we began to realize, if you want to understand a microbial community, you have to understand who's there, what are the bacteria there, what are they eating, and what are they making? And it turns out, the way we've been taught about microbial communities is a little bit simplistic. In fact, it's rather beatific. Right? You're portraying microbial communities as if they were gardens or, uh, or, or lovely forests. Well, no. Those are photoautotrophic ecosystems. They get their energy from the light. You just have to reach up. That's not what it's like in your uh, intestine. It's a war in there. It's dark, it's wet, it's anaerobic, and who lives, eats. And they eat each other. So it's much more appropriate to think of this as a carnivorous open zoo. So milk had to solve that problem. And the way it does it is by recruiting this very specific and protective bacterium and nourishing it all day, every day. So there's a flaw. Right? So mammals have developed this remarkable process of live birth. And one of the advantages of that is at the birth process, the bacteria from the mother transfer to the infant. In fact, now that we appreciate that, the whole birth process is starting to make sense. In fact, we rather comically watch children. They're watching a birth, and they say, oh, dad, look. The mother's cleaning the baby. Well, yes, she's licking her baby all over, but technically she's not cleaning it. She's making sure that all of her bacteria transfer over. I'll, it turns out a very good idea. But modern medicine. Inadvertently, antibiotics, cesarean sections, infant formula have been breaking that chain. In fact, <laughs> Not good news. Um, we've been looking at cohorts now around the world. And it turns out where modern medicine has gone, with the best intentions, remember, antibiotics, miracle drugs, save more people and animals than anything else in history. C-sections, save mothers and babies. These are very necessary, valuable treatments. But they do have unintended consequences. And where we look, where modern medicine has been most successful, the percentage of babies that acquire the right bacteria is getting less and less. So we tried a clinical test. If you take 
babies in the greater Sacramento area, born either by C-section or normal birth, do they acquire bifidobacteria? We found none of them did. But if we give them the bifidobacteria as, in essence, a live product, within 48 hours, that bacteria grows and grows and multiplies. It grows spectacularly. It literally completely dominates the ecosystem community of that baby. In fact, it pushes all the other unpleasant bacteria out. Over 80% of the biomass of the diaper is a single strain of bacteria. And it's genuinely helping the baby get rid of all the bacteria that's acquired from the environment that are not particularly appropriate. And there's all sorts of things that this implies about the early education of the immune system of the baby, the acquisition of pathogens, the education of metabolism. But there's a rather interesting outcome. This is the poop coming out of a baby. So if a breastfed baby does not have the right bacteria, then the oligosaccharides keep streaming out. And in fact, pediatricians recommend mothers to anticipate from four to nine loose diapers a day. However, if they get the bacteria literally within 48 hours, the oligosaccharides disappear, the bacteria numbers go up, and their metabolites, uh, in essence, proliferate, acetate and lactate. They have one diaper a day. And the pH is interesting. The pH of the, in essence, the top baby, pH 6. Basically, all pathogens can grow at pH 6. If the baby gets the right bacteria, in fact, the pH is 4.5. And those of you who know food microbiology, no pathogen grows at 4.5. This is a shelf-stable baby. So you're beginning to see that, that this is a really good idea. It's not new. We went back and looked at the literature from the 19th and early 20th century, before there was antibiotics and before there was C-sections. And there were some interesting papers, Tissier, the French microbiologist, the only tool he had in the 19th century for studying bacteria was the crude microscope. And that's what they did. And so the, in essence, nomenclature persists to this day. They looked at bacteria. They were round. They were rod-shaped. They were different sizes. That's how they described them. And of course, Tissier took this tool set to look at bacteria from all sorts of places. And not surprisingly, he looked at human poop. And lo and behold, oh my gosh, it's just full. Every imaginable size and shape. So it's clear that humans are full of bacteria. What's interesting, however, is at one point he looked at a breastfed baby. And he remarked, oh my gosh, there's only one there. And it's a pretty un un unusual shape. What he called a Y shape, which is bifid. So in fact, a hundred years ago, and all the way back through human history, we had this, in essence, unusual ecosystem in breastfed babies. We've inadvertently knocked it out. So what have we learned? Uh, we're not alone. The bacteria in us are really important. There's more oligosaccharides in human milk than protein. Evolution has decided it's as important to feed the bacteria in the baby as the baby. We're going to have to change the way we look at uh, health, a whole new way. We've got to feed the bacteria in us. They will become, in essence, our minions. It sounds like food is going to get unpleasant. We're going to have to eat bacteria and food for bacteria. Well, not so much. If you look at the valuable food products that have come through the culinary art, through history, chocolate, coffee, wine, cheese, beer, bread, kimchi, yogurt, they're not commodities. They're a combination of a commodity plus a microorganism. And as a result, those products are more stable, more nourishing, more, more valuable, and more delicious. So the future is actually going to be more nourishing, more safe, safe, more stable, and more delicious. So it's up to you. If you're going to, in essence, have a better life, if you're going to make a better life for the world, you're going to have to be disruptive. There are tools available out there to start changing the way we grow, process, and deliver food. It's not going to be the way my generation made it. Sorry. But it's possible now to imagine a very different future for food and for the quality of lives. Thank you.
Do you have any movies or just no, slides? No, no okay. Here's this. Thanks. I like those. And which side on is this, this side. going on? Okay. Well, it's got a lot of stuff with it. Ugh, this is involved. Mm -hmm. Here. All right, this is me. Hi. Wait, did I do that? Hi, everybody. OK, good. Seems You're to be good. working. You're on. Broccoli, carrots, soy. Just no, making it's sure. It's Sound okay. check here. On your mark, get set, go. Yes. OK, maybe I'll turn it this way so I can see it. Well, thank you very much for inviting me with these fabulous co-speakers. Bruce, that's the first time I've heard that talk. That was uh, incredible. And I'm going to try to set Justin up here. I am a nutrition scientist. Quick background that might be fun is uh, in 1986, I showed up here with a little longer hair and a little goatee, and I said, hey, Morgan Hall, can I get a master's degree in nutrition here? And they said, you were a philosophy major in upstate New York, and you never took any science. I said, yes, I did. I took Psych 101. That's how I got out of my general ed requirement. <laughs> I said, you're missing two years of science. I took them. I came back. They actually gave me a PhD. And I've been at Stanford for 25 years. But really, all I wanted was a vegetarian restaurant. and that. That may be where I'm headed now, because all my research says you should eat more fiber so that you can support Justin. So my talk is really all about fiber, but I've become a human interventionist in the field of nutrition. And so I'll give you a little narrative to show how that works for me. So I've done a number of studies, which I'll spare you ginkgo, soy, antioxidants, uh, things like that. One of the most recent ones I did was a weight loss study where we compared low fat, low carb. And we actually didn't even care if low fat or low carb won, because they don't. They always tie on average. And the interesting thing that Bruce was pointing out, too, is sort of the inter-individual variability. So in our study of 600 people over a year, uh, we were not interested to see which diet was best overall, but which was best for who. So we were expecting an enormous amount of variability and we wanted to try to be able to explain it. So I have a very complicated study design here. But in essence, we got 600 people who had 15 to 100 pounds to lose, men and women, generally healthy, non-diabetic. Um, they bled for us. They pooped for us. They peed for us. They answered questions. And we just collected as much data as we could so we could try to account for this variability. And here, this has not even been published, so don't tell anybody so you don't wreck my chances of getting in the New England Journal of Medicine. This is the final result, but it's not really the final result. This is what we call a waterfall plot. So each bar is one person in the study. Uh, it doesn't matter which diet is which. The top one, I think, is low carb, and the bottom one is low fat. But can you tell it doesn't matter? Isn't the distribution of weight change in 12 months looking identical? So what I think is fascinating, in the process of losing 6,500 pounds collectively, we saw an 80-pound range of differential response to the same advice in both diets. Isn't that cooler that they're like a pound different on average? So what the heck? We gave them the same damn advice. How could it be that when we give some people low-carb advice, somebody gains 20 pounds and somebody loses 60 and everything in between? And the same for low fat. So what this study was really designed to do was to see if there was a genetic or a metabolic, maybe in terms of insulin resistance and being predisposed to diabetes, or thanks to Justin, a microbiotic difference in these people that created a predisposition to do better on one diet or the other. So I think this is the new field of nutrition is looking not for average, but this individual variability and trying to account for it. Now, oh my god, I'm going to get so many publications out of this. So many postdocs are going to work on this. And it's going to be so misrepresented in the news. And I'm going to be misquoted. And it's just going to be, make things worse at one level. Because when you try to communicate this to the general public, they will make claims about our low-fat, low-carb study, which really don't take many of the subtle nuances into account. Like For the first thing, calling them low-fat and low-carb are just wrong. 
there isn't one low-carb diet. It's uh, maybe lower than what you're eating now. And there isn't one low-fat. We've done studies before where people have a crappy low-carb diet or a really good one, or a crappy low-fat diet or a really good one. So even within those two realms of diet, they're very different. And we're going to tease that all apart. And at the end of the day, I'm going to get great publications. I'm going to keep my job at Stanford. And honest to God, confessions of a nutrition scientist, more people will be confused. <laughs> Not help. That's my vision. So I do that to keep my job and to get publications. Um, but this is my favorite quote from the people who lost the most weight. It wasn't a low carb or a low fat thing. We changed their relationship to food. They didn't snack so much. They were more mindful. They went to farmer's markets on both diets. Part of it was that they were so mindless about eating they had put on that weight. And being mindful helped them take it away. So that gets into some other things like the insane anti-carb craze that we have going on right now. Oh my god, all of a sudden carbs are evil, right? And so let me just point out a couple things. I would totally agree with this evilness. Sugar, evil. Added sugar, more specifically, not in fruits and vegetables, but all this added sugar that we're dumping on food. And I can take the authors of all the top diet books. I can take the paleo, low-carb fanatics, and I can take the low-fat fanatics and put them all in a room and they'll all agree, added sugar is bad. Don't do that one. And I can also get them all in a room about white flour. Oh my gosh, Americans eat something like 175 pounds of grain a year, and about 90% of it is wheat, and almost all of the wheat is refined white flour. So we eat an insane amount of white flour, and all these guys, low-carb and low-fat, would trash talk the white flour and say, no, 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 too much. But this anti-carb thing is nuts, OK? So I don't know how many of you grew up with the food pyramid, but we've replaced it now with my plate. This is my plate. I know it doesn't look like food, but at least a plate is more like what you eat off than a pyramid. Who ate off a pyramid? Anyway. <laughs> OK, so this doesn't actually have any food on it. So here's a rendition that has food. And audience, pretty much every category in there has carbs, OK? The veggies, mostly carbs. The fruits, mostly carbs. The grains, mostly carbs. The dairy, got carbs. The protein side, everybody thinks it's meat, but really it's beans and legumes and other things in there, mostly carbs. So if we do this anti-carb craze thing, we're going to be missing carbs and fiber. Think fiber, because it doesn't really come with other foods. It comes with carb-containing Food. So I made my own carbohydrate pyramid. This is mine. Um, nobody's published it yet, but it's absolutely brilliant. And at the very top of the pyramid are the foods you want to get rid of, just the top. Just the fine flour and the sugar. All the other stuff is magnificently delicious, culturally appropriate, and fabulous food. So please get over the anti-carb craze, all right? It's just nuts. And think of all the things that are cool about it. I could talk for an hour, like Will said. For today, think fiber. You're going to get fiber from the foods that are carbohydrate rich. So don't go crazy on the anti-carb craze. OK, then the next thing we have is we've had this whiplash about, oh, everybody should eat low fat. Oh, no, that's wrong. Everybody should eat low carb. Oh, we'll trash one, we'll trash the other. And somehow in that whole thing, protein stuck out as OK. Protein, it's like the only thing that hasn't been trashed. So all of a sudden, it's satiating. It's great for brain powder and sexual drive and growth and, and everything. So we have this fascination with protein. And Americans think protein is meat. They really do. They think of it as meat. So this is a food and agricultural organization chart of 150 countries and how much meat they eat relative to their GDP, which is also in terms of PPP, which is some more global measure. Anyway, go on the x-axis and you get more money. And go on the y-axis and you get more meat. And there's one country that's off the chart. And it's us. Holy crap. Are you kidding me? Like every other country, once they get enough money, they stop eating so much meat or, the, or it stops increasing. Uh-uh, not Americans. We win. More of stuff is better. OK, that is just, that's, in, that's obscene, really. So here's another way to look at it where the FAO graphed how much protein the world gets from plants versus animals. And look on the far right. We totally win. We kick butt. We decrease our animal protein, our plant protein, and we increase 
are animal protein. Wait, what did I just say? Sorry. Anyway, you get it. Right side, um, increased animal, decreased plant. And the plants, the plants have the fiber. OK, so you see the theme here? So not only do we eat way too much meat, what the hell is this? <laughs> because more protein than any other country in the world isn't enough. So on top of that, we've got to have a shake and a bar and a big cylinder of soy protein powder before we go to the gym to get ripped so that we get enough protein. <laughs> Dang. As you eat all that protein, you're moving stuff off your plate that had fiber. You are. We're eating less and less plants and less and less fiber. Why? I have no friggin' idea. So some of our protein <laughs> requirements were established here on this campus in Morgan Hall in the penthouse so long ago that no one remembers. This is in a, this huge tome that's 600 pages and about 150 have to do with protein. And if you look, there's an estimated average requirement and then a safety factor on top of that, which is the recommended daily allowance. So find your weight. Extrapolate a little, go down and see what's probably a requirement, and below that is a safety buffer just in case you need more, because in this room you're all above average, right? I heard Will say everybody is above average in this. Yeah, so you probably don't have the average requirement for protein. You are above average. So go ahead, go higher than that. Now, how much do Americans eat? They eat about double the RDA, which had the safety buffer on it. What are they thinking? They're, thinking, they're listening to marketing, and protein is cool, and, tra and carbs and fats are getting trashed. So we've had a recent set of uh, guidelines reviewed. Politically, this didn't quite fly. Let's not get into the politics of the Dietary Guidelines versus the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee, which is a more objective body, who said, we've got to stop eating so much meat, and we've got to eat more plants for our health and for the environment got dismissed in the Dietary Guidelines of 2015. But see if you can uh, answer this question. Think for yourself. This is one of the problems that we have. There's this myth going on that I'm prepared to bust apart even further later. Do plants have protein? Wait a sec. Let me think. I showed you a slide that said they did. OK, how about this? Are all plant foods missing some of those essential amino acids? Think back to that high school class you had. Uh, are some plant foods missing some of the essential amino acids? Because there's 20, and nine are essential, and you have to get them from your diet, and the other 11 your body can make. Or, or do all plant foods have 20 amino acids? Can we do a quick quiz? You thought about it. Who votes for number one? Plants don't have protein. Who votes for number two? Uh, plants, all plants are missing some of the amino acids. All plants are missing some of the amino acids. How about three? Some plants are missing some of the amino acids. All plants have all 20 amino acids. That's the correct answer. I have a whole set of slides. If you ask me when we're sitting in the chair, and I'll show you, but I don't have time to do it now. So I have backup slides. I don't know where we got this idea, but they all have all 20 amino acids. They're in different proportions, and they're not the plant proportions of, pro of amino acids are not perfect for the human body. But if I show you data, you will be stunned how close they are. They're almost identical. OK, how many of you know a vegetarian? How many of you have seen them fall over from protein deficiency any time recently? I am so sick and tired of people asking me, so, Professor Gardner, where do you get your protein? OK, I've asked every physician I know. None of them has ever treated a vegan or a vegetarian for protein deficiency. Never. Never. Unless they had an eating disorder or something else was going on, that's possible. So I don't know where this silverback gorilla got all its protein, or the bison, or the cow or the elephant, or the dinosaur, or Mr. Universe vegetarian, but you really can. You can get all the protein you need from plants, and the plants have fiber, and the meat has no fiber. OK? So I've been on a, a quest to get people to get over some of these issues and eat differently, and when we tell them about grams of fiber and milligrams of antioxidants, their eyes roll in the back of their heads and they fall asleep and they don't listen. So a uh, pediatrician and I invented this class that we run at, at Stanford, and we did it with the help of a behavioral psychologist, Eric Heckler, who's an awesome postdoc. And we kind of did some of the parts of this class uh, in our own class called Food and Society, where they read not scientific articles, but they read about food culture issues. 
And they watched documentaries. And they didn't have quizzes or midterms or exams. They had to write an op-ed and try to get it published. And they did YouTubes, and they did blogs, and it was all a very discussion-based class. And really, all the topics were animal rights and welfare, global warming and climate change, and human labor abuses in slaughterhouses, agricultural fields, and fast food workers. OK, we published a study on this. We asked our students before and afterwards what they ate. And we did three parallel classes in the program in human biology. And we have data published in a study that says our students change their diet more than others. We even have graphs like it's scientific. Look at this. We got a graph. <laughs> we have domains of food. OK, and there's the p-value, statistically significant. And this, OK, let's stop for a minute. This is a horrible study. Why did they publish this study? Who knows what's wrong with this study? They self-selected into our class. They had their names on the pre and post things. So they, if they wanted a good grade, they said they changed. Uh, it's self-report. I don't know if they really did it. We only did it for 10 weeks. I don't know if it lasted. You can shred this quasi-experimental study, but why did they publish it? I think they published it because the stuff we do doesn't work. The stuff we do for behavior change around nutrition is ridiculously ineffective. It's mind-numbingly boring about grams of fiber and milligrams of antioxidants. And this was a different approach. So if you think of Pond's book, Omnivore's Dilemma, about this ridiculous dilemma of unprecedented choices, I used to give hour-long lectures on every one of these things. And I've kind of had a midlife crisis because of all the times the press misreports what I do. And now I talk more about the other side of food. And what happens in our classes, we're teaching it right now. Actually, their op-eds are due uh, tomorrow for this year's class. And what we find is that there's a different hook for each student. There isn't the same one. Some are really into the animal rights and welfare, and some are not. They grew up on ranches, and they treated their animals OK. Some are really into climate change, and they never understood before. Now they're getting less meat, better meat. Some are into the human labor abuses, and so they're, they're finding ways to find other. But they're all being more mindful. And as they do, the thing that cracks me up is they're changing their behaviors in all the way I wanted them to. When I did the damn NIH-funded trial about the milligrams of antioxidants and the grams of fiber. So I'm really interested in them eating more fiber so that we can promote this microbiome that I'm setting Justin up for. But one of my challenges is this idea of moving human behavior when we have all these patterns that are so established. And we've been having fun linking societal and external costs of food to choices, and we have been having a blast. And I, every year I teach this class, I know that the scientific paper isn't all that rigorous, but I watch these students every year wrestling with food choices, and they are engaged. I just love how this topic engages them. So I'm going to end on two quick notes here. Uh, as I move forward, I, I'm realizing it has to be delicious. Bruce is absolutely right. It has to be delicious. And so I hug a chef whenever I can now. And I have taken on a role as a scientific advisor of the CIA. Does that make sense? You got that? I considered the Food and Beverage Institute and the National Restaurant Association. But I decided those weren't appropriate, so I stuck with the CIA instead of the other ones. And so now I get to hang out with chefs all the time. And I love this guy, who's the head of strategic initiatives for the food industry. He wants to raise the unapologetic deliciousness of food. And as a nutrition scientist, I know exactly where this is coming from. For 20 years, we said, I have a really healthy thing for you. It's got a lot of fiber. I put a lot of fiber in this thing. And it doesn't taste as good as the thing that you wanted to eat, but it's so good for you. Did you, did you hear me whine how apologetic that is? No, he wants to blow this out of the water. Stop apologizing. Elevate the unapologetic deliciousness of food. So they have a group called the Menus of Change. We've had uh, four annual meetings. The fifth one's coming up. They have a whole set of principles of change. It's very chef-driven. And one of the things that they've latched onto the most is the protein flip. And the protein flip means stop having beef at the middle of the plate and use beef as a condiment or have smaller portions of beef in a global fusion of herbs and spices and grains and vegetables so you're not dichotomizing the vegetarians and the carnivores. You're bringing the menus together in a global fusion of cuisines from all over the world that taste great. And they have less meat 
and more plants. That's what the protein flip is all about. And if you freak out and say, oh, but I won't get enough protein, hopefully I convinced you a little, and then you'll ask me afterward to show you my amino acid slides. <laughs> so we've spun this off into the Menus of Change University Research Collaborative, and Berkeley is one of our 25 members where 25 universities have signed up to use their dining halls as living laboratories and have students study themselves around these kinds of choice issues, behavior issues, choice architecture. And so we're kicking one off uh, this week where we're doing a mushroom beef blend for burgers. And the taste test is comparing a 60-40, 50-50, or 40-60 mushroom beef blend. And to be honest, mushroom beef, which was done at Davis, wins in taste over 100% beef. It wins, but we don't know what the ratio is. So we're going to further use the labs and the dining halls as a way to experiment with which one of those ratios is better. So we're really having a lot of, a lot of fun. At the end of the day, to tie into today's talk, a lot of the stuff I do is around this. I do fancy NIH studies, and I have poop and blood and statistics and stuff like that. And at the end of the day, all my stuff gets blown away because people say, yeah, but I don't eat carbs. I'm paleo. I'm gluten free. Or I, I'm buff and I'm ripped and I'm going to go all this, get all this protein and all this meat. And I said, oh my god, all the science I do is for not? Oh my god. So I'm interested in getting rid of this anti-carb craze, getting rid of the protein obsession. And in the process, people will eat a lot more fiber. We have a national recommendation to get 30, 35, 40 grams of fiber a day. According to the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, Americans get half as much fiber as they should. And instead of going for more, they go for one more protein bar and one more protein shake and one more chicken breast. Got to stop that and reverse it so we can get closer to the Hadza, which Justin has studied in Tanzania, where they get, no joke, 150 grams of fiber a day. It's possible. And so I would like to leave this in Justin's hands to take this the next step, because I think it's all about fiber. Thanks for your attention. Well, if you didn't get enough of uh, if you didn't get enough of Christopher and Bruce tonight, I think they're both featured in the Michael Pollan documentary in Defense of Food. Isn't that right? Yeah. So if you want to, you know, check that out. Do everything you need. And that goes in there. You're not showing up. Let's see. Let's go to there. There you go. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. OK, it's wonderful to be here. I'm here to tell you how you need to eat more protein to feed your microbiome. No, I'm just <laughs> kidding. Um, the most important thing is that we have enough time to chat at the end, and I noticed the person with the card is gone. So I hope she comes back, because I want to make sure I don't talk, speak too long, because I want to, you know, we have to have time to talk. Um, OK, so first of all, thank you for this invitation. I've known about this course for years, and to actually be part of this incredible uh, lineup of speakers that you have into this class is really phenomenal. Um, so thank you, and that, that includes our speakers tonight. So it's really an honor to be here. Um, and also, it's great to be here in front of an audience like this. Hundreds of trillions of you, <laughs> if we don't just count the humans. And the diversity is phenomenal. Thousands of species out there, I see. This is great. So of course, I'm talking about the microbes in the room, mostly. And most of these microbes that are in this room are in our gut. This is the gut microbiota or gut microbiome. And we harbor this incredible, diverse community that's impacting our health in many, many different ways. I mean, it's really phenomenal. But these microbes can also drive you to d disease if you don't take care of them. And it turns out what nourishes them is what you eat. And what we're learning is that what we eat in the modernized world isn't that great for our gut microbiota. And so today I want to tell you about 
you know, there, this is an incredibly complex system, the gut microbiota, how it interacts with humans, it's different in all of us, and it's gonna be a long time before we really understand how to target the microbiota to attack it in a medical, clinical sense. But we're learning some basic principles that I think everybody should understand because we can start doing things right now in our everyday life to help our microbiota to feed it and make the best of this community that we can. So that's, that's what I'm hoping to, to get across today. Okay, and, and I wanted to, so Will sent this story out. This is, you know, the local hero, Moises Velasquez Manoff, had a um, New York Times op-ed this past week um, in honor of Valentine's Day, Microbes, a Love Story. I won't read the whole thing, basically saying microbes can affect your health in many great ways, but the bottom line, they can also, it seems, make us sexy. And so this is a special Valentine's Day edition of um, learning about the gut microbiota. So anyway, well, you'll see little things throughout the, throughout the talk. Okay, so this is the gut microbiota. So this is an image taken by a, a former graduate student in my lab, Kristen Earle. She made her whole PhD dissertation about taking beautiful images and trying to learn things from them, um, focused on the gut microbiota. This, so in this image, what, what we do is we take a, a colon out of a mouse, we cross-section it, stain it with fluorescent probes, and then look at it under a microscope. So that's what you're looking at here. The bottom right, is host tissue. So those are colonocytes. Every blue circle is a nucleus of a colon cell. And in the top left, every single one of those colored rods there is a bacterial cell. So this is the gut microbiota. So you can immediately see how dense this community is. You can see how close it is to our tissue, this incredible interface. These microbes are secreting chemicals all the time, so it's like we have a little unregulated pharmacist in our gut, dispensing drugs. We're trying to understand what these are. And then there's this green strip running through the middle. Anybody want to take a guess at what that is? Mucus, yeah, wonderful. Yeah, so that's mucus. This is the barrier that we secrete to keep these microbes at a safe distance. You've heard good, uh, good fences make good neighbors. That's also true in the gut microbiota. So this mucus layer is incredibly important in keeping these microbes, as beneficial as they are, separated for, from our human tissue. And so an astounding stat, by cell number, we're actually more microbial than we are human. We have more microbial cells. If you take the collective genome of all these microbes, it, en it encodes greater than 100 times more gene products than our human genome. So incredible developmental signals, metabolic capabilities, many of which we don't yet understand, are encoded in our microbiota. And the field is rapidly moving from just understanding who is there, census taking, mapping what microbes are in which body sites, to really understanding how these microbes integrate into our biology, what functions are they carrying out? And it turns out that one of the major functions, the, one of the major professions of gut microbes is to degrade complex carbohydrates from our food, complex carbohydrates in dietary fiber. And so most of the microbiota lives in the distal gut, in the colon, and the fiber you eat makes its way down there, feeds this community, this community of microbes ferments it and then produces all sorts of chemicals, including things like the short chain fatty acids, these fermentation end products. And so here's our first candy heart for Valentine's Day. I'm only slightly gassy. We may as well address this right up front. It's true that when microbes are fermenting, they produce more gas. However, there's a wonderful adage, the only cure for an intolerance of beans is a steady diet of beans. And actually, in some of the human studies that we're doing now, we engineer in a ramp period for people that are changing their diet drastically, incorporating more fiber, because there's a lot of anecdotal evidence from doctors that a slow ramp will decrease the symptoms and get you to a point that is just like you were at baseline. So first Valentine. OK. So, um, so again, another image of the gut microbiota, in this case, the epithelium, the host tissues on the bottom, mucus is being secreted upward, the microbes are 
um, the, the red dots up there, and then the bright red material is plant cell wall material. This is an indicator of dietary fiber flowing through the system. And so I became infatuated with how diet impacts the microbiota during my postdoctoral fellowship at WashU. I did an experiment where I was just trying to understand basically what microbes were doing in the distal gut. It was right kind of at the beginning of this field before it really took off. And what I found was they were largely degrading dietary fiber. And so I was curious, what would happen if I removed all the dietary fiber? Would these microbes be lost from the system? And so I performed an experiment where I kept one group of mice on a high fiber diet. And then I performed, I, pu I put another group of mice on this other type of diet that we call the Halloween experiment. This is what happens to all of your microbiotas at the end of October if you're eating candy. And so what we found is that the microbes indeed aren't lost from the system, they actually just change what they're doing. So they turn off everything for degrading the plant polysaccharides, and they start consuming mucus, because mucus is made of carbohydrate, and it's actually a backup food source for these microbes. So if you're not eating dietary fiber, your microbes start eating you. And so what happens to the mucus layer? So we collaborated with Casey Wong in bioengineering at Stanford. He created this wonderful software program that assesses where the microbes are in the gut in a quantitative way. And we performed this study very convincingly showing that if you feed mice a fiber deficient diet, the microbes not only start eating the mucus, they thin it, they get closer to host tissue, and they start to incite inflammation. This was over just, a, I think, a one-month period that we saw this. Imagine what happens decade upon decade of eating a low-fiber diet, what's happening to your gut. So of course, you know, as I'm doing all this research over the past almost 15 years, it starts to sink in, you know, what, how, how profound this is, how it can affect your biology. I work with my wife, she's a scientist, we run this lab together, and we noticed that we started living our lives very differently. We started raising our kids differently, eating differently. And we noticed that, so this is a, a um, scene that we created to, um, to really impress upon people how we eat. There's manure on the table, there's a lot of vegetables. <laughs> and we noticed that none of our friends, as we were changing our lifestyle, even scientists, were not doing the same things we were doing until we'd go to a microbiome meeting, a conference where everybody there studies the microbiome, and then everybody was doing these same things. And we thought, well, this is just us having access to information that most people don't have access to. And so uh, my wife and I decided to write this book, The Good Gut, a way to translate the science to non-scientists, but also to talk very candidly about how it's impact our life, Im impacted our, our lifestyle. So, not only can the microbes affect digestion, gut health, what's become clear over the past decade is that our gut microbiota can affect everything in our body in some direct or indirect way. It can affect the immune responses that are going on in your lung. So how likely you are to get asthma, how well you fight off a respiratory infection, how rapidly an autoimmune disease progresses can all be impacted by what's going on in your, in your gut microbiota. Metabolism. How you store calories can be impacted by your gut microbiota. And then there's this emerging area of the brain-gut axis where it appears moods, behavior, perhaps neurodegenerative diseases can all be impacted by your gut microbiota. So this is really a phenomenal community. It's a control center for human biology. And so the way that um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of us in the biomedical community are thinking about this is that it's going to be a great lever for precision medicine. You may have heard of this, it's the idea that we don't treat people as a population, we treat people as individuals. We understand what's going on with their biology and we treat them appropriately. And because the microbiota is highly individualized, because it's malleable, we can change it, and because it's wired into so much of our biology, it means that we can actually use it as this wonderful lever. But as I mentioned, it's incredibly complex, so the horizon for that is still a ways off. So to what extent can we manipulate our own biology via the microbiota? And there's a lot of strategies for creating tools and a knowledge base for doing this. This 
crazy idea of engineering microbes, synthetic biology, creating microbes that can actually perceive what's going on in the gut and make decisions in there, respond to inflammation with an anti-inflammatory drug. But over and over again, what we're seeing is that diet is really the major lever that we have in hand right now to do something to impact this community. And so this is just a thumbnail sketch of metabolism in the gut. We know that um, dietary fiber and what we like to call microbiota accessible carbohydrates, it's nice to see a lot of you got that answer right in the quiz at the beginning, um, that these are really the primary fuel for the gut microbiota. They turn them into these fermentation end products. There's fierce competition for these MACs. And then there are other microbes that actually don't eat the MACs, but they get fueled by the fermentation end products. So this is this incredibly connected food web, but the major gateway of changing what's happening in this community is what you eat in your, what you eat in your diet. And so yes, so this is all connected, but it's connected through what you're eating. Okay, so two very different metabolic scenarios. So I already described the one where we're eating a high fiber diet. So that's on the top here. The carbohydrates make their way to the distal gut, you end up with a lot of fermentation end products like short chain fatty acids in your bloodstream. And that contrasts to what happens in the Western world where we are eating a lot of starch, sugar, and fat that gets absorbed in the small intestine, leaving our microbes starving and eating our mucus. So very different metabolic and physiological scenarios. The environment that we evolved in where calories were scarce but fiber was abundant and where we live now. So this creates some, somewhat of a conundrum. So let's talk about the microbiota in the Western diet. So how has human evolution, how, how has evolution of human diet affected the microbiota? For our existence as a species on this planet, about 200,000 years, our diet has changed relatively drastically. For most of this time, for 190,000 years, we were mostly foraging, eating huge amounts of dietary fiber. Then we started farming about 10,000 years ago eating less fiber, and now we eat this highly processed food in the modernized world. So going from around 100 to 150 grams of dietary fiber per day to 15, tenfold decrease in the primary nutrient that's feeding this important component of your biology. What does that mean for your health? And so wouldn't it be nice to go back in time and understand what the microbiota used to look like? have a time machine and, and ask what is a paleo microbiota, what does that composition look like? Well, of course we can't do that, but one thing we can do is we can go to traditional populations, populations of humans that live hunter-gatherer lifestyles and ask what does their microbiota look like? And so people have done that. This is one example, one study published from Jeff Gordon's group. If you just look at the chart on the bottom, that shows the number of species in the gut microbiota in two traditional populations in South America and Africa compared to Americans. They contain a third again as many species as most of us harbor in our gut. So it appears that we have lost species over the course of our modernization. We have lost gut microbiota diversity. <laughs> Send a valentine to your gut microbes. And so as Christopher mentioned, we've been studying the Hadza hunter-gatherers in Tanzania, the incredibly gracious people that have um, agreed to participate in our research. There's only about 1,000 of them left, 200 living a really strict foraging lifestyle. This is them sitting around a fire cooking one of their tubers, incredibly fibrous material. And so we've, we've studied their gut microbiota, incredibly diverse. It fluctuates over seasons, really incredible data. And then I had this wonderful grad student that figured out how to put all the data collected from all the traditional populations to date, which are different data types, put them all on one chart. And that's shown here. So it's a little hard to see. These are all the different populations on the left. And then how that population's microbiota sits relative to other microbiotas that have been studied. So hundreds of individuals' microbiota data captured on this one graph. And you can see a pattern immediately. There's this group over here and this group over here. These are all the industrialized populations and these are all the traditional populations. So whether you go to Papua New Guinea, Papua New, Papua New Guinea, Africa, or South America, 
If you live a traditional lifestyle, your gut microbiota looks more similar than to the closest Western population. So this strongly suggests that there was this evolutionary state that we, existed for, that we existed in for most of our evolution that we've departed from relatively recently. What does this mean for our biology? Great, great painting from Banksy. This captures the idea that we have these two components of our biology. We have this human biology that evolves relatively slowly and then a microbial, bi microbial biology that evolves relatively rapidly. And yet these two need to work together. And so what happens when you have really rapid dietary change that can change your microbiome, but your human genome doesn't change? You have this asymmetric plasticity of these two components of your biology. And so we think that there's been this great reduction in diversity over the course of our evolution. What does that mean for our health? And we wanted to test this experimentally. So we actually set up a nice experiment in mice because it's really hard to study humans over the course of generations. And so we gave mice a human microbiota, gave them a high fiber diet, and then split them into two groups, a low fiber and high fiber group, with the expectation that the low fiber group would have a microbiota diversity crash. Indeed they did, and then we were curious if we brought back a high fiber diet, would the diversity come back? So this is asking the question for all of us, is it too late? Can we just start eating a high fiber diet? And so we were amazed, a lot of the diversity came back, and more so than we expected. And so we thought, well maybe this is the fact that we've done this just over a single generation. So we repeated the experiment over multiple generations. We put the mice on a low fiber, low MAC diet for multiple generations and asked, what happens to the microbiota? So this is data from the control group. These are the high fiber fed mice. Four generations, generation one, two, three, and four. Each row here represents a different mouse. Each column represents a different microbial species, the 200 most abundant species, least likely to go extinct over the course of the experiment. These species are rock solid over the four generations. They get passed from mother to child again and again and again. These are more variable. And these guys over here actually go extinct. So even on the high fiber diet, there's a loss of microbes. So what happens on the low fiber diet? Total dec decimation of this community, compounding extinction over the course of generations. So if your microbe says they're ever yours, it may not be true. So here's where we are. We've had these diet-induced extinctions in our gut microbiota. Where do we go? Is diet enough to bring back our microbes? Do we need to reintroduce these microbes? How important is this for human health? These are all big questions that we don't have answers to right now. But to get at this, we've recently started at Stanford the Center for Human Microbiome Studies. This is serving as a platform for enabling us to ask some of these questions actually in humans, see the health effects of eating a high fiber diet documented in high resolution, see what happens to the microbiome. These are studies we're doing with Christopher's group, um, just getting started, but it's gonna unroll into decades of studies that establish the best way to nurture a healthy microbiome, because this is something we understand only at a very crude level right now. So I wanted to leave you with this, food preference. We are wired for caloric density. The Hadza eat five foods. Three of them are plants, berries, baobab, and tubers. That supplies all their fiber. That's what they eat the most of. And then honey and meat are the other two. Yet if you ask them what they would eat all the time if they could, they say honey and meat. So if you put them in a restaurant or in a supermarket, they would make the same bad decisions that we make. And so the question is, how in a free and affluent society do we get people to eat a better diet. We can do all the studies we want to do, find out exactly the right diet that can nurture a healthy microbiota. We kind of know what that is. It's going to be eating mostly plants. And people will still not do this. And so is the answer education, policy, food technology? Can we make a French fry that feeds the microbiota? Is this even a good idea? <laughs> Maybe all of the above. I don't have the answer. Finally. 
I want to thank my group because they have contributed all the data and ideas to this. Um, thanks to funding sources, and then thanks to all of you for your attention. Justin and uh, Christopher and Bruce are also here. They're very kind and generous to come spend the evening with you, but they're also on a recruiting tour for graduate students for any of you that are interested <laughs> in going into this field. So they're the, they're the place to, to study. So one word that I didn't hear you mention that's really in the news right now, particularly with the USDA, a lot of data around animal welfare being taken off of federal websites, I didn't hear the word antibiotic. Oh, um, yeah. Hmm. Maybe we could talk a little bit about that. And <clears throat> That's a huge topic in our class, sure. So the physicians are concerned that 80% of the antibiotics in the US go to livestock. Uh, it's leading to MRSA, the multiple resistant Staph aureus. Uh, there's been a voluntary system to stop using them. Uh, it, it's all quite controversial, So the, but the sad thing is, it arose out of a necessity when we did factory farming. Factory farming arose out of volume issues, so we have a huge demand. Can't meet it with grass-fed, so do it with factory farming. When they're in close contact with one another, they're getting sick. To make it economically viable, they don't just treat the sick animals, they treat them preventively. So the antibiotics go in their feed, and once they put them in their feed, they found out it makes them grow faster. And so they can, they can be uh, grown to slaughter age and weight quicker um, in these factory farms. So it's a really complex situation. It's not just about health for the animals or prophylaxis. It's dollars and pounds of meat and factory farm and this push for more meat. So I'll just open it up like that. It's quite controversial and complex. You want to add to that? Oh, sure. Actually. Um, the, the ubiquitous use of antibiotics is, is in many cases beneficial, acutely, inappropriately used for production, but, but it's having consequences. And, and we found out in an interesting way. UC Davis, we have the world's largest ag school, vet school, and, and what that means is, I mean, we have spectacular numbers of, of veterinarians. And John Madigan is the world's expert in foaling racehorses. So we have, he wrote the book, literally. And, and actually, I don't, don't know if you know, but racehorses are born about the same time of year every year in the spring, so they all race at the same age. Well, this past year, um, at a big foaling uh, barn near Davis, uh, the first foal of the year, uh, within the first couple of hours, came down with diarrhea. Uh, and actually, it uh, went out with his mother in, in the evening, and uh, in the morning was dead. The second foal, diarrhea. Oh. Third foal, diarrhea. They were all coming down. Turned out they were getting C. Diff seal uh, diarrhea, and, and it, was, it was devastating. And, uh, and, and so John had heard about our work, and we had basically proposed that, that this was a mammalian phenomenon, that if you get the right bacteria when you're, you're, you're young, this is good, but antibiotics could have killed it off. And it looks like that's what happened to the horses. The mothers didn't have the bacteria to pass on. So we developed a cocktail of bacteria appropriate to mare's milk. Uh, it took us a while, so by that point, 14 foals had been born. All came down with C. diff infection. And it's a nightmare, actually, because it's a spore-forming bacterium. So by this point, the barns are full of spores, and every foal is coming down. But by the 15th foal, we could get them, in essence, protective bacteria that, that basically live on, on, on mare's milk. And that foal was fine, the next foal fine. So we basically completely eradicated the problem. But it highlights what antibiotics had done is basically put the entire, in essence, next generation at risk because they've lost this, uh, this, this bacterial population. Uh, we've probably done that to all of our domestic animals. Companion animals, production animals, zoo animals. Um, we've, we've, we've basically made a, a bit of a mess. 
And and to step you know beyond the use in agriculture, I mean, it's very clear that use for infections is wonderful and it's, it's saved countless lives. Um, but certainly, it you know when you take oral antibiotics, it just decimates the gut microbiota, wipes it out, and in fact opens up the possibility of something like C. difficile coming along and wreaking havoc. Um, and so, you know, I think antibiotics, because their safety profile is so phenomenal, have been used just, w you know, way too much. And now there's um, kind of just kind of the glimmer of recognition, I think, from clinicians that there's this cost that hadn't been weighed before because beneficial microbes just weren't on their radar when they were prescribing antibiotics. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that the tide will really swing in terms of how frequently they're used and limited to serious bacterial infections in the future. But um, it's something that everybody should be having serious, you know, if, if your physician says, well, let's try antibiotics, um, asking if a wait and see approach is appropriate is certainly a, a good question to ask, I think. A lot of the questions this week had to do with this kind of recovery. Can we come back from the brink of extinction, you know, if we've been kind of, you know, mesmerized by this Western diet or, you know, just influenced by it unconsciously, can we come back and restore ourselves? I think one of the things I'm kind of excited about with your assignment is that you have the opportunity now with all the speakers you've heard and all the reading you've done to maybe completely rethink what a restaurant might deliver. True. So maybe let's talk a little bit about you know recovery, make it personal. You mentioned a lot about fiber, but where would somebody start right now? I mean, like if you were to walk into that FIFO cafeteria, I mean, what would you do <laughs> as a starting point? Oh, we got a. Oh, Justin. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Maybe move it up a little bit, or maybe check the um, volume over there too. Okay. Can you hear me? No. Go double. Okay. <laughs> um, so, so if I if I went to you know I th I think the. Um, you know, in, in terms of, of seeking fiber, I think the way Christopher phrased it is, is really perfect. I mean, just to kind of seek real plant-based foods, I, I really try to stay away from refined, you know, starchy foods that probably don't have a lot of, of complex carbohydrates. You know, in terms of recovery of the microbiota, it's, it's not clear um, how much diversity we can get back just through diet because um, there, there's a great microbiologist in my department, Stan Falco, who just won the National Medal of Science last year, and he, he loves to say that the, the world is covered in a fine patina of shit. And um, this means that we are constantly doing a low-grade fecal transplant on ourselves continually from all the people that are around us, and whether those microbes stick in your gut or just pass through is probably largely dictated by how diverse of a diet you're eating in terms of fiber. But you can only reacquire the microbes that are present in the regional species pool. And we know from studying these traditional populations that there are microbes that were present for most of our evolution that are just not found in the United States. And so you can definitely increase your diversity through diet over the short term. You definitely will not acquire some of these microbes that we've co-evolved with. And what that means for our health, we have no idea. This is another good case to promote immigration, it sounds like. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, like it, it's true. I mean, in terms of exposure to microbes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know, the one other point that I, want to, that I want to make that I didn't have time to make during my talk is that, you know, people ask, well, what, so your microbiome's degraded. What is it, what, what's the big deal? You know, what does this mean for our health? We know these microbes are important. You know, we have an epidemic right now of Western diseases. These are diseases that you all know when you hear them by name, cancer, heart disease. These are the major killers. These are what's, what are filling our hospitals. No longer infectious diseases. It's now all these chronic diseases. And the common denominator of many of these diseases is one thing, inflammation. And so while that may mean heart disease for you and it may mean multiple sclerosis for me because of our genetic diversity, we're all headed towards one of these diseases eventually. 
And there's some pretty good evidence that the dysbiosis that's happening in our gut is one of the factors that's driving us forward. So solving this problem and understanding it in great depth is of primary concern, I think, to people living in the, in the Western world. Christopher, you've got another 38 slides on amino acids, but <laughs> for the benefit yeah. of the business school majors in the room, can you talk to us a little more about amino acids and, and why we should care about them? No, you shouldn't. Okay, so really okay. The point is okay. that you shouldn't care. So it's pretty fun. I've been showing these slides to a lot of people. I showed it to a room of 500 dietitians. I asked them those same four questions that I showed you guys. Uh, 496 got the question wrong, and the four senior dietitians in the front of the conference got it right. So I don't know why we're missing this or, or why we have this confusion, but there's really plenty of amino acids to go around. Uh, the short story is the plant proteins uh, have a, a distribution that's not perfect, but how many of you have played Scrabble before? How many of you know that there's a lot of E's and N's and there's not many Z's and Q's? Okay, well, I like to think of it as people getting two or three bags of Scrabble letters to play on the board. You can't actually fill that board with more letters than is in one bag. The whole, have you played till the bag is gone? There's no more place to put a word. It's kind of like protein. So if you <laughs> felt like you didn't have enough X's or J's, you get another extra bag and another extra bag and the proportions aren't perfect but it's enough, you have enough of all the amino acids to do it. So just have food, stop sweating the protein thing and enjoy food and this restaurant that you're gonna have, don't be worried about balancing all this stuff out, make incredibly delicious food, global cuisine and no, don't worry about it. But what about like the corn, bean, like we've all heard these complementary plants that... <clears throat> how many hippies, how many know Francis Moore LePay, diet for a small planet? Google Francis Moore LePay, she's apologized since then. Uh -huh. That the complementary, so just as a quick thing, if you required 40 grams of protein, and you were a vegan, and you only got 40 grams of protein, you would not meet your requirement. Because the distribution would not be perfect. But if you're a vegan who needs 40 grams of protein and you ate 80, then the proportion doesn't matter anymore because all of the amino acids were present in all the foods. And by the time you ate 80, it didn't matter what the distribution was anymore. There's a couple of amino acids you'll hardly break any down of, and there's a couple you'll break a lot down of because you got a lot too much. But I, again, I like the whole Scrabble thing because it makes us think how different the proportions are. Well, if you come back next week, Anna LaPay is going to be speaking here. Oh, fantastic. Great. Yeah. <laughs> She's the, she's the offspring. We'll have to check her microbiota. She wrote See diet for a hot planet Correct. instead of diet for a small planet. That's right. <laughs> I love that. Who's got a question? Right here. We'll repeat. You can say it, and then we'll repeat it. Why don't you try to re repeat that? Yeah, question? right. It's a, so, it's a, um, thank you. Yeah, good question, and I get that one a lot. So, the I, the question um, distilled down is basically whether GMO crops will affect the the max and the microbes in your gut ability to degrade those max. And I would say that there's no evidence for that now. I mean, GMO covers a wide range of what can happen in a plant, um, but th there's there's none of these technologies that I'm aware of that would have any impact on the fiber or the microbes in your gut ability to utilize fiber. Now, an extension of this question is, um, what about things like pesticides and, and other chemicals that we spray on it? And so if you go to something like Roundup, uh, um, it inhibits a pathway that we know that microbes also have, and nobody's looked at that in detail, but theoretically there is a possibility that chemicals that we spray on food could have an impact on microbiota function. Great. Who else has got a question? Up here. Sure, I'm not sure how that ties into this, but I'll take a stab. So I got millions of dollars of grants to study soy. Uh, it, 
of all the plant kingdom foods, uh, it's kind of cool. It has more protein and more fat than all the other beans and has this cool stuff called phytoestrogens. So phyto means plant and estrogen means estrogen. So it's a plant like, it's an estrogen like molecule in plants. And for a while, it was the big heyday that it explained why Asian women don't have hip fractures. It explains differences in menopausal symptoms because of the phytoestrogens. And really, a lot of that has subsided, and there's been a backlash that, oh my god, the men are going to grow man boobs. So make sure you stay away from that. And that hormone therapy makes breast cancer worse, so it, we, can't subscribe, we can't prescribe this for women at risk of breast cancer. Kind of all of that has gone away. It's not a superfood. And it's not got all this risk. It's really a pretty, pretty good solid food. My biggest concern with soy, I have two. One is we subsidize it and grow an amazing amount for animal food. So we're actually not eating most of the soybeans. We're feeding it to livestock. And two, when we do eat it, there's enough of a health halo left. The best thing to eat is edamame and tempeh, because it's the whole bean. Soy milk, they took stuff out. Tofu, you make out of soy milk, so you took more stuff out. And let's not even go with the soy hot dog or the soy ice cream or the soy candy bar. That's just crap. So that's just Americans taking this soy thing and reformulating it and processing it. So there's a lot of different issues with this. So I don't know if you had a particular concern, but it's a fine food and it's overhyped and overblamed and included in your diet. It's probably got some great max in the soy. Yeah, absolutely. And, and phytoestrogens actually also are metabolized by the gut microbiota and do amazing things. So, oh, yeah. Well, look, oh, one more question. Okay, in the back. Yeah, great, great question. Um, Keep the question. Yeah, so the, so the question was, um, what type of fiber? That's a big question. And then you broke it down into whether it should be soluble or insoluble. But it's a hugely complex question even beyond that. Um, and then you mentioned specifically juicing, which I think is interesting. If I, I had a, actually um, a donor to our lab um, took me into his house. He was giving me this big check, which was kind of cool. And he showed me this juicer that he had. And I told him, I said, you know, you should juice your vegetables and throw the juice away and eat what comes out in the back of that machine. <laughs> and so he started doing that and said he felt phenomenal. Um, so, so, Soluble and insoluble, we don't, and, and so the problem really with juicing is that you are getting rid of a lot of the um, complex carbohydrates. There's probably a fermentable aspect of this that's important for the microbiota, but there's been some evidence that also just bulking of stool and increasing motility is an important thing, which um, a lot of the insoluble fiber does. The um, juice portion of that also has a lot of sugar in it. It also has a lot of other good nutrients, so I would just eat the food that you're sticking in the juicer. Um, and then in terms of like complexity of fiber, we don't, you know, fiber is this massive category. There are different definitions depending upon whether you're talking about a chemical definition or, you know, there's, and there's different chemical chemical definitions. Um, so we, th our resolution right now is, uh, you know, go after a diversity of plants, vegetables, fruits, legumes, whole grains, nuts. Um, and then eventually, when we get everybody up to speed on that, then we'll be able to attack the personalized aspect of this and say, okay, after eating a good diet, you still need to eat more inulin or arabinoxylin to increase the proportion of this bacteria. Um, but right now, there, our resolution is just eat a lot of different plants. And can I add one thing to that? So go ahead and Google a list of foods and see the proportions of soluble and insoluble fiber. Almost every food that has fiber has both. If your doctor said, oh, I really need you to stay off the soluble this week and only eat insoluble fiber, you could not do it. You could not find a food that has one and not the other. They all have both, and their proportions differ a little, but it's quite often almost half and half. Well, let's take the Bruce, Justin, and Christopher challenge and eat more fiber tomorrow. <laughs> and fermented foods. That's a, we didn't really talk about the fermented foods. And fermented foods. Invite us back next year. OK, yeah. next year, <laughs> fermented foods. Thanks for coming. <laughs> and come join Anna LaPay next week. That was fun. Right?